However, uh what i would like to say is that social science western social science is actually the religion of the west and it has uh, it has no <clears throat> claim to factuality it has no resemblance to physical science uh, and uh, because we have been deceived into believing a religion which is diametrically in conflict with islam with the uh, under the false uh, conception that social science is neutral science just like carpentry or just like building a car so uh, accepting some of the central tenets tenets of western social science has made it made it impossible for to us uh, to understand the teachings of islam so it's a really quite a central issue all right so um uh, i would like to differentiate between what the islam what is the knowledge that was given to us by islam what western social science is and what it claims to be which is a universal truth so at the heart of the islamic revolution which came to this planet 14 centuries ago was a revolutionary knowledge the initial words of the wahi are iqra bismi rabbikal ladhi khalaq khalaq al insana min alaq iqra wa rabbukal akram al ladhi allam bil qalam allam al insana ma lam yalam so allah taala starts by stating that he is going to give mankind a knowledge what uh, which he did not know and we can see the effects of this knowledge on history that uh, the bedouins who were ignorant and backwards were catapulted to the leadership of the world so this knowledge was obviously very powerful kind of knowledge but uh at the same time we see that muslims are at the bottom ranks of civilization today so obviously they do not have this knowledge that they that they acquired and it's this is in accordance with the prophecy that islam came as a stranger and will become a stranger so how was this knowledge lost and how can it be recovered and i am saying that basically the knowledge that was given to us by islam is diametrically in opposition to western social science and western social science is taught to all of us and we end up believing it and therefore we cannot access islamic teachings so what is the fundamental knowledge of islam and it's very simple islam teaches us how we can become human beings and how we can achieve excellence in conduct and how we should build our families how should we build our communities how should we build societies and what should be our attitude towards humanity as a whole uh so that is that would be the roots of an islamic social science if such a thing existed which it unfortunately does not and now as opposed to this as we will see uh western social science is built on entirely different foundations basically it's based on rationality objectivity and um individuality every person is an individual he is every person is a mini god he has the right to do whatever he wants to do and nobody should interfere with it. that is freedom and uh similarly then the issue arises that how do you when you have so many gods around how many how do you decide the how the group should work so well then there is the democracy that okay since everybody has a god everybody has an equal right to be participate in the decision making so just count the number so on the so all of this i'm saying is that 
Western social science is a religion, but it claims to be a science, that it is objective, empirically grounded, rational, factual, and this claim has been widely accepted. And once we accept this claim, then it becomes impossible to understand what Islam was all about, and therefore it becomes impossible to launch an Islamic revolution. So to begin with, we understand that what is Western social science? It is an analysis of European hist historical experience, and it is extracts lesson from the uh, so what happened to societies in Europe. However, European uh, social science pretends to be universal. It says, no, this is not particular lessons that we derived from European history, even though you can show very easily that that is what it is. But they claim that it has universal application to all of humanity. So two people, uh, I'm citing two experts who have understood that, and uh, Michel Foucault says that modern human sciences purport to offer universal scientific tr truths. But in fact, these are expressions of ethical and political commitments of Europe. And similarly, Timothy Mitchell says that the possibility of social science is based on taking certain historical experiences of the West as a template for a universal knowledge. So basically, social science is an expression of certain ethical and political commitments, but it is disguised as a universal scientific truth. And now, uh, colonization is basically a conquest of minds. This is, we all think of that colonization was physical conquest, but you can't understand, uh, but a few, uh, a handful of people cannot control millions unless they acquire their willing assent to this rule. And the willing assent is acquired by feeding them a framework of the world uh, that, that uh, allows them to agree to this colonization and to accept this and to think that this is for the best. And so basically, the um, social science is exactly the science which provides the justification for Western superiority and for our inferiority. It explains and rationalizes. And as long as we believe this, we will believe that um, uh, the West is superior to us and we will. Uh, and the only path to progress lies through acquiring their knowledge, which includes the social science. Now, as opposed to this, the, um, uh, the history book called Global Rift by Stavrianus tells us that actually the development and the wealth of the West is exactly the opposite side of the underdeveloped and the poverty of the East. Basically, very simple, West colonized the world and they extracted millions of uh, pounds of surplus wealth from India and from all over the globe. So uh, the wealth they stole made them rich and made us poor. It's uh, exactly the same thing. So the the so-called development of the West is just the name for their wealth. And uh, if we look at social science, if we look at physical science, it has very impressive achievements to boast of. But if we look at social science, when we ask, what did you accomplish? So we see that the last century has been the most deadly century in the history of humanity with uh, 50 million killed in World War I and II, an almost continuous state of warfare. And um, just most recently, any millions of innocent civilians destroyed in Iraq and Libya and Syria and all over the world. Uh, there are wars going on continuously only in the name of power. And this is the law of the jungle is dominant in the world. And if you have the power, this justifies its use. And no one will question why you went and destroyed the entire infrastructure of Libya, the hospitals, the industries, and of Iraq. Uh, no one asks this question. Uh, but uh, those people who don't have power, if they do even a small crime, 
uh, they are called to question. So basically, this is what the social science, the social science is based on uh, ideas developed by Machiavelli. And it has led to breakdown of families and communities, the rise of suicide, the loss of happiness in uh, market economies. Lots and lots of people have noted that all of this accumulation of wealth has not made uh, extremely rich societies happier. And uh, there is uh, so uh, destruction of the human, uh, the human individual thinks of himself as nothing more than a, a piece of uh, material for sale in the labor market and does not realize that human lives are infinitely precious. Uh, families and communities and societies have disappeared and vanished. And in fact, uh, uh, according to the leading thinkers, there is no such thing as society. It's all just individuals. So social science has nothing, uh, has not contributed uh, to creating uh, prosperous societies. So basically, a key to the Islamic revolution that we want to launch is knowledge. And that requires that rejection of Western social science and replacement by an Islamic uh, alternative. But how can this be done? So to do this, we have to deconstruct Western social science. We have to understand what it is, how it emerged, what were the problems because social science claims to be universal. We don't even think about it in these terms, but uh, we have to think about it in particular terms. How did the West come to this body of knowledge historically? What were the problems in European uh, societies that led to the creation of this uh, body of knowledge? Also, a very important and interesting issue is why does this knowledge pretend to be universal? Why do not they say that our knowledge about societies is based on European society's experience and cannot be generalized, which is actually the truth. Why do they claim that it is universal when it is not? So uh, for that, we have to go back to the origins of Western social science, which starts with the loss of faith in Europe, loss of faith in Christianity. Now, what the Europeans have told us and we have accepted on face values is that the sun of reason rose in the West. And when this enlightenment occurred, Europeans learned to reason and think for the first time in human history. Nobody else had ever learned uh, reason and rationality and thought. They were all just uh, following whatever the ancestors said. And in the light of reason, Europeans saw that religion is just a collection of superstitions which makes mankind's backwards and uh, puts us in ignorance. And the, the light of reason showed them that science is the way to the future. And it leads all of us to, and, and they uh, had tremendous achievements. And the process of what has been called deification of science, uh, it uh, came to be believed and, and continues to be believed widely that science is the only source of reliable knowledge and that ultimately science will solve all of the problems of humanity. However, uh, this narrative is uh, not true. So what, are the, what is the counter narrative? So we have to dis, uh, discover, uh, we have to create the counter narrative because this narrative, although it is available from European sources, it's, it's not, uh, you have to dig it out because it's not the mainstream. So in uh, one of my lectures, uh, which is referenced on this slide, I have discussed four causes for loss of faith. It was not that uh, Europeans learned to reason and then they saw that religion was wrong. Actually, what happened was that there was a sequence of Renaissance popes who were extremely corrupt and they flaunted their corrupt behavior. They had mistresses and illegitimate children and they sold uh, pardons for sins to raise money. And uh, that's, uh, that was the cause of the Reformation. The Protestants came up and then the Protestants and Catholics started fighting in uh, enormously violent ways. If anybody has seen the Game of Thrones, this is exactly the depiction of European history that the uh, uh, cruel and barbaric uh, uh, wars just for the sake of power 
just for this, uh, just uh, played as a game with the lives of uh, millions of people, just to achieve uh, power and glory. Thirty years war took place, which in which eight million people were lost. It's still one of the bloodiest wars in history, and there were many other causes which led to a disenchantment with religion in the West. Uh, one of the important ones was also the unrealistic religion of Christianity, which gave, which made as ideal uh, no sex, no uh, family, uh, poverty. So the ideals that they held up was were uh, unrealistic. They were not human. So they were, uh, e even the popes could not hold to these ideals. And people thought that religion is just hypocrisy. So uh, th this, these are particular events, but the big picture which we should understand is that there was no model of excellence in human behavior which the Europeans had in front of them. The models that they had, which came from Christianity, were extremely defective, both in terms of theory and in terms of practice. So they did not have ideals which they could follow and they were left to develop these ideals from using their senses, their intellect and their reason and empirical experience. But this, uh, this uh, uh, breakdown of religion, which eventually led to a widespread loss of faith in Europe that uh, Christianity is not true and therefore religion is not true. This is one of the major problems which has occurred in European history that they immediately generalize from Christianity to all religions without examining any other religion. So they said that, well, if Christianity is false, then all religions are wrong. And similarly, if uh, Christianity causes warfare, then all religions cause warfare, even though this is historically incorrect. But this loss of faith was enormously um, traumatic for Western intellectuals because, uh, and many, many people, many, many major social thinkers have expressed uh, the despair that follows from loss of faith, that if there is no faith, then everything is just an accident. And uh, Bertrand Russell has a quote that we must, uh, that, that there is nobody watching if you do good, nobody cares. If you do bad, nobody cares. And nothing matters in the end. We will all be wiped out in a big uh, atmospheric uh, 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 physical catastrophe. And so we must build our lives on the firm foundations of unyielding despair. Nietzsche uh, had a parable of the madman who came into the society and said that you have killed God, meaning that uh, you have lost your faith in God. And this is enormously consequential. You do not realize the enormous consequences of the deed that you have done. Uh, uh, I think it was Camus who said that suicide is the only serious philosophical question. Given that life is completely meaningless, should we continue to live this? And there were these philosophies of Dadaism and uh, existentialism, which basically say that there is no meaning to life. We create the meaning uh, as we would please. <laughs> so nearly all major 19th century European social thinkers suffered from nervous breakdowns. So, but the uh, more important issue for our purposes is that the consequence of loss of faith were that all of the fundamental questions which religion answers were uh, left open. How was the universe created? How were humans created? What is the meaning of our lives? How should we behave towards each other? How should we organize our society? <laughs> what is the nature of knowledge? How can we distinguish between truth and falsehood? What is good? What is evil? All of these questions were open because religion is no longer accepted as the reliable source. So you have to start from scratch, from zero. You, are, you can only rely on your aql, your intellect, and your empirical experience. You reject everything supernatural because reason, as interpreted in the Enlightenment, meant that you must reject anything which you cannot see. <coughs> so social science is exactly the name 
of the efforts to answer these questions using uh, observations and logic. So uh, some of the simple answers is how was the universe created? It was not created. It has existed forever is what the science scientists thought. But the Quran says that in the creation of the heavens and the earth, there are signs for those of understanding. And actually, when it was discovered that the universe was created uh, at one point in time, <clears throat> and there was nothing before that, this caused huge amount of uh, perplexity because uh, this was, uh, there was a huge question that is opened. Well, if the universe was created, then who created it? Uh, and there are many, many puzzles that, uh, that are created by this creation of this universe, which have no answers in um, contemporary science. And when you ask uh, the scientists about the answer, they say, we'll find the answers, don't worry. And that's all. So they have faith in the ability of science to find the answers to major puzzles which cannot be resolved at this point without uh, positing the existence of God. So actually, at this point, <clears throat> uh, science, uh, uh, belief in science is a faith in the unseen, in the, in the uh, hope for the future that someday we will find the answer to the question of how this universe was created because nobody knows the answer. Similarly, the complexity of the human creation is so large that Leading biologists have said that this cannot come out. Life cannot come about by an accident. So Watson was one of the, of the double helix fame said that even though he was an atheist, he said that life could not be created by, uh, by just uh, by random recombination of molecules. It's just too complex. And so he said that since God does not exist, the only possibility is that some advanced civilization sent a rocket ship uh, across the stars to seed life for this planet. So he is willing to believe anything except God. But um, <clears throat> even these are simple questions, how life came into existence, how the universe came into existence. Maybe science can find an answer to these questions one day. But the major issues which science cannot find an answer is what is the purpose of our lives, except for just saying that uh, it is meaningless. And this is what is uh, that is what the conclusion is. And similarly, what is the nature of knowledge? What is it that we know and what is it that we cannot know? So can we learn about meanings? Can we have visions? Can we have deeper understanding then that goes beyond what we can see? <clears throat> so once you reject God, as happened in Europe, then uh, you come to the conclusion that life is meaningless. And this leads to a lot of consequences that uh, alienation by Marx, where, whereas people used to find meaning in their work, now it's just work for money. The purpose of life is the earning of money. And the value of human life is measured by the amount of money you can earn. Uh, commodification took place so that human lives became uh, measurable in terms of gold. <clears throat> So we sell and buy lives in the labor market. And also the land, which used to be the mother earth was the metaphor for the planet that it nurtures and sustains us. And in return, we must nurture and sustain the planet. No, now this was just a dead machine <clears throat> and our job was to earn money for it. And this, is, this change in attitude is actually responsible for the environmental catastrophe that we are facing. And since there are no morals that can be derived from empirical resources, so the only purpose of life is pleasure, power, and there are no, no moral constraints. So global conquest is justified if you can do it. And all strategies, all is fair in love, love and war. If you can deceive people, if you can... Um, uh, uh, if, if, it, if you need to uh, kill 6 million people in order to achieve your goals, there is nothing to stop you because logic says that if that's what's necessary, then you should do it. And so basically it's the law of the jungle. We are just animals like other animals and the survival of the fittest is the, uh, is the social science of today. And it justifies 
both warfare and business corporate business tactics today <clears throat> so so the islam uh teaches us entirely different uh lessons about human beings it says that islam is deenul fitrah it is uh, given it's uh, built into our nature and our hearts can are uh, very interesting the quran mentions in many places ja'ala lakum as-sam'a wal absara wal afida we gave you the eyes and the ears and the heart so the heart is also an organ of perception it allows us to see god but it also allows us to see uh uh see good and bad and so uh the this is denied by the west man has no built in nature it he comes out by with the tabula rasa his uh, mind is a blank and he has no heart and no soul these are not uh, observable and so not scientific to think about that so basically uh, all social science theory was constructed on rational and empirical grounds so we do profit loss calculations and today in economics you can find many articles on profit loss calculations for raising children is is the amount of money we spend and the pleasure we receive from raising children uh, uh worth uh, the 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 rewards that we get and similarly should we take care of our elderly parents uh we spent money and effort and will it, it, it will it be repaid so uh this, these are the social science questions that uh we are uh, now because we are rational and empirical and we put hearts and souls and our our fitra out of the question then these questions arise uh the only solution to the construction of morality there are two major principles there is uh, the religion that was uh, launched by jeremy bentham that um, uh, he was uh, strongly opposed to christianity and he said that the only uh, rule for morality is pleasure and pain if something gives me pleasure then it is good if something gives me pain then it is evil so that's the only principle of good and evil that is known to the west the other uh, principle on which that's at the individual level now what should happen at the social level well that uh, morality should be created by consensus if we all agree to some law then that law is the morality now the problem is that different uh, states have different laws so the conclusion was arrived at by hegel and it is now um, yani built into the framework of social science that morality is only at the national level and so nations as entities are above morality so this uh, theory was used to justify an enormous amount of barbarism in the world wars 1 and 2 where for example germany bombed mercilessly uh, various cities and countries for uh, and and they said well ethics does not apply when uh, you are talking about inter uh, interstate relationships all of this is opposed to islamic ideals uh, which have Uh, given us uh, principles for all of these so basically um the the only uh, principle of social science is freedom and hegel said actually the end of history uh, was fukuyama's article hegel said that basically history is a drive towards freedom freedom is the only principle of society all of us are mensur gods and basically society will be Uh, reach the end when everybody is free there are no rules no external principles no laws that we should follow worship of the nafs is what the quran calls it and freedom is the principle in all spheres of our life in our social sphere we should we are free to do whatever pleases us if we, if we if we want to commit ourselves to family that's fine if we want to break off that commitment that's also fine no promises are binding upon us in the economic realm again freedom is the rule and that's laissez faire let everybody do whatever they want and in political realm freedom is the only rule so this is the social science of the, these are the roots of the social sciences 
So in terms of nature of knowledge, according to Western epistemology, knowledge is only of the uh, observables. Uh, we cannot have knowledge of unobservables. So heart and soul and things like purpose of life, excellence of conduct, spiritual progress, <clears throat> these are <clears throat> just meaningless words because we cannot see these things and we cannot do experiments to find out what happens after life. We cannot do experiments to learn about spiritual progress. Um, actually, human beings are unique. Every single person is unique. So science cannot be applied to the construction of our lives because I, as an individual living in uh, at the moment, I have life experiences which make me completely unique. So no pattern of experience, past experiences applies to my life at the moment. <clears throat> so once you say that science is the only source of reliable knowledge, then life experience becomes uh, totally irrelevant because it's unique one-time phenomena and you cannot build a science on it. So basically lives of human beings, human beings are turned into robots, which turned, uh, that's what behavioral economics is, that we respond to stimulus and uh, a reward and we can be conditioned to do whatever we like whatever uh, is desired our behavior can be shaped and there's nothing inside us so the theory of knowledge is based on uh, where the quran starts with as a characterization of muslims uh, uh, western philosophy Social science is based on Allazina Yunkiruna Bil they reject anything which cannot be seen. So, <clears throat> so in, to found uh, to create, to launch an Islamic revolution, we must create an Islamic social science. And there is a thousand years of intellectual uh, material which we can use for this purpose. So it's not that we have to build from scratch, unlike the Western social scientists who had to start from zero and use only their aql and their mushahada, their uh, observation of their own society and their own intellects. We have a huge amount of, we have, we, we start with the solid foundation of wahi, revealed knowledge, and then we use a thousand years of uh, effort which has been gone into developing the Islamic uh, ulu. <clears throat> So this is actually a golden opportunity for us. Today, Muslims are shocked in shock and awe of the West and we have done sajda to Western expertise. And that's why we are unable to see the defects in social science. Today, when, when somebody, uh, basically it's uh, the share of Iqbal that uh, I was not, my eyes were not dazzled by the brilliance of Western knowledge because they were protected by the dust of Medina and Najaf. So Iqbal was protected, but nearly all over the Islamic world, intellectuals are deeply impressed by Western social science and they accept the findings and they say that we are a hundred years behind or more. And so first we must acquire this knowledge and then we can be in a position to contribute. They don't realize that the emperor is naked. Western economic theory is all nonsense. Uh, if you look at what Freud thought about human beings and compare it to what Islam teaches us about the nature of human beings, you see that he is a baby lost in um, uh, in uh, in talking about any you know, nonsense really, which uh, uh, in comparison with the sophistication and depth of Islamic teachings. So today the main problem is that because of our sajda to the West, we are unable to realize that the Quran and the Hadith offer us far deeper wisdom than about economics, politics, psychology, society, environment, than PhD from Harvard University. And that is the problem that we want to get that PhD from Harvard first and then, uh, but that makes us blind to the wisdom of Islam. So, um, what are the some of the foundations? Well, basically, 
uh, Islamic social science will start with the foundation of the human beings that every human being is infinitely precious. Every human life is infinitely precious. And what does that mean? Quran says that if you take one life, it is as if you have killed all of humankind. And if you save one life, it is as if you have saved all of humankind. So my mathematical minds find this very difficult to digest. How can one equal uh, 5 billion or 7 billion? So the uh, the point is that this is talking about potential. Just like one seed, if it is developed, contains the uh, thousands of seeds and then millions of seed as the tree which it uh, brings will create a thousand seeds and all of these seeds will go on to create further seeds. So actually one seed is equal to a billion trees if it is, uh, if it achieves its potential. Similarly, Every human life is infinitely precious. So we must uh, go beyond. Uh, we have been trained by our education into thinking that lives are for sale and purchase. And the value of life is that however much money you can earn in your career. So we to, to, to learn that lives are infinitely precious. Then the goal of the society is to ensure that everyone can develop his potential to the maximum. It is not to ensure that the GNP per capita is maximized. So one of the first uh, things that we need to do is to inspire and motivate our, st our students to reach for the stars, not to sell themselves to the highest bidder in the labor market. So these are some of the things that we need to do. So how can we, uh, we can talk about infinite potential, and, but unless we uh, exemplify this unless we sh realize it in ourselves, unless we struggle to realize it, and unless we teach others how to struggle to realize it. Uh, this is just talk. So we have to, to understand this, we have to understand the complex nature of human beings, that we have hearts and souls, and the human heart is a battleground for good and evil. On the hand, on one hand, we have uh, the nafs and the shaitan and the environment, which is constantly tempting us towards the evil. And at the same time, we have uh, the wahi and the, we, have the, uh, we have the guidance, which is telling us what is good. And uh, we have built in fitra, which guides us towards the good. So there are three stages of spiritual progress described in the Quran. One is the nafs ammara, which is exactly corresponds to the homo economics of economics which says that it is driven purely by desire and pleasure. And this is the basis of Western social science. So, uh, and also Western economic theory. So we say that how can we get beyond the nafs ammara? Well, it, this is when we fight against the, uh, what the economic theory calls the fundamental principle. The fundamental principle is utility maximization. Every human, every rational human being seeks to maximize his pleasure. We say, no, we, if we reject the pleasure, and Allah Ta'ala says, ke, Lan birra hatta mimma take the most precious thing that you have and give it away for the sake of Allah. This will actually strike a blow against our nafs. And that is the source of spiritual progress that when we, we bind our nafs, we don't give in to our desires, then we will make our progress. And that eventually leads to nafs al who is a man who has a conscience and he feels social responsibility. He, he feels pain when he sees somebody else is hungry and naked and he has the means. And uh, if you keep making spiritual progress, you get to nafs al where you are integrated with the creator and with the creation of God, the family of God. And this is the state which uh, about which huge amount of controversy exists about the Vahdutul Wajud philosophy and so on. And so anyway, the thing is that you will live in harmony with the designs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will not feel uh, 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 the, the, uh, in the same ways that uh, people who are at lower stages of spiritual progress do. So the goal of a life is to struggle to achieve spiritual progress and to ensure that everyone in society can also do the same. So some of the key aspects of this is to build uh, families, which is the fundamental social unit of societies. 
if families are broken down, as currently in the West, more than 50% of the children are born to single mothers. So they don't enjoy the, and this has uh, any documented statistical consequences in terms of the children who are coming from broken homes have higher rates of depression, suicide, alcoholism, drug use, and all sorts of problems. So how can we build strong families? Uh, there, Islam offers us a huge amount of important guidance on this. And there are books and books about the rights of the husband on wife, the rights of the wives on the husbands, and the rights of children on parents, and so on. But the key unit thing which, which summarizes everything is the love and mercy between the hearts of the parents and also the love and the mercy of the parents for the children. Once, if you have this uh, love, then all of the rules uh, love will teach you. But if you don't have that love, then no amount of preaching of rules is sufficient to uh, create the families. So Islam has the institutional structures for the larger social units. Uh, to build our communities, they are the masajid where we are supposed to gather five times and create the group feeling. Today it has left only as a ritual. People like myself go to masjid for 10 years every day uh, and they don't know the person who is, uh, who is standing next to them. They recognize the face, but they cannot tell the name. So the, the, the ritual remains, the buildings remain, but the heart of the matter has gone on. The Juma was supposed to gather larger communities and in the Eden, even larger communities and the Hajj was supposed to gather the whole Ummah. So the institutional structure remains standing, but the spirit has been lost. And yeah, the Prophet Sallallahu is told, will you kill yourself with sorrow if they don't believe? So the Prophet's heart was full of love and compassion for all mankind, not just the Muslims. Today, uh, the Muslims are divided into small sects and they are doing takfir to each other and forget about the kafirin that those are, uh, yani they don't have mercy towards each other, uh, forget about the kafirin. So again, we have strayed very far from the origins of the deen. And the love that we receive in our family is what is supposed to teach us how to love others, how to love all human beings. But with the breakdown of the family in the West, this has cast huge shadows in the Islamic world. And we see a huge amount of rising divorces and, and uh, uh, family structure problems, which we, which we did not experience a generation ago. Uh, there are uh, strong institutions which were built by Islam, which have all been lost uh, in meaning. So there are actually two types of interest. One is the social uh, loan. There are two types of loan. There's the social loan, which is given to people in, in need. And for that, we have Karze Hasana. And there's the business loan. And for that, we So today, uh, both of these, uh, uh, and both of these institutions are enormously superior to the interest. Today, we do both of them on the basis of interest. And this is extremely harmful. And many, many books and articles are written on why interest is harmful. Uh, most interesting is Atif Mia and Amir Sufi's book on house of debt, which uh, makes no mention of Islam. It's, these are Yale economists and their book has, uh, a, they make no mention of Islam, but they explain how interest is very un cruel and unjust. And it was directly responsible for the global financial crisis. And if instead of interest, a Mosharka mechanism where the bank's interest is aligned with the interest of the homeowner so that both are part parties. The global financial crisis would not have taken place. <coughs> uh, excuse me, Dr. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but I think your video yes, uh, has paused. Uh, if, if you can try or, or oh. we can go ahead without it. Well, uh... How, should, how can we uh, try it? Should we you stop can, share or should we? No, no, no. You, you can turn off your uh, video and you stop video and then uh, start it again. Oh, the, that I icon, see. maybe it will work. Okay.
Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I think let's uh, we can it's continue. It's uh, saying that uh, Zoom meetings is not responding when I uh, it says close the program or wait for the program to respond. The video is oh, not working. Sorry to interrupt you. You're voice perfectly voice. audible. We can perfectly hear you, but we're not able to see the audio from your side. Yep. Right. I understand. Uh, when I try to reach the Zoom controls, uh, what it does is it says that uh, Zoom is not responding. Okay. Dr. Sab, you can stop I this screen sharing. Continue. By this way as well. Hmm? No, uh, uh, none of the Zoom controls are now accessible to me. It just gives the, uh, the I can see the panel, but it uh, starts circling, okay. uh, giving a wait signal. I'm on the nearly the last slide. So let me just go through it. Uh, if, if you can hear me, then I think it should be fine. Yes, we can hear you this perfectly. You can com complete time. your presentation. Then for question and All answers, right. we'll uh, try to figure it out. We will reconnect. We may have to reconnect. Yes. We may have to. Okay. All right. So basically, there are uh, we we don't have to build on scratch. Oh, now I've got it back. Let me uh, try to stop video. No, it's not working. All right. So um, I said that the interest institutions we have alternative institutions which are not being practiced among is uh, among Muslim countries, and this is really the the sad sad story that today, instead of using our own institutions of karz -e hasana and Musharka, which are far superior to Western institutions, we are trying to mold Musharka into an interest uh, alternative. Instead of utilizing the genuine Islamic uh, institution, we are trying to use Musharka and Hila to create an instrument which works just like Western interest, because we are so convinced of the superiority of West that we cannot imagine that our Musharka is actually superior to Western interest. Similarly, a central institution of the West is the bank, which is used for the accumulation of excess wealth. The, our counter to this is the waqf, which in which we use excess wealth to spend on others. And a society, just think, a society where every man keeps his excess money for himself, would you like to live in there, that society or would you like to live in a society where everyone who has excess wealth is willing to spend on those who don't have? So uh, the waqf, uh, the, the waqf is, a, is the institution for a society where everyone with excess wealth wants to spend it on others. Similarly, uh, we had guilds in the marketplace. Guilds are co collections of people like doctors, like... Um, woodworkers, etc. But the, uh, the key characteristic of guilds is that they are out to serve society. They are not there to make profits. The reason that monopoly got banned in the West because everybody was out for profits. So if the doctors form a, a monopoly, then they will uh, start exploiting people and I think uh, Dr. Sub got disconnected. Uh, he'll, he'll reconnect. Just call. Jiji, so uh, you have the link. Can you connect again? Sorry for that, everyone. Doctor Sab is uh, trying to reconnect. 
So if you can just hold on, he'll be here. Yes. Uh, on the second last slide, We just started, now I'm going to share screen. All right, so. Are we okay now? Are we connected yes. and? Yes, we are good. If you All can right. just uh, maximize the. All right, so I was talking about the institutions. We have amazing institutions which are basically built on cooperation, generosity, social responsibility, pursuit of excellence and conduct, as opposed to this Western social science and Western society is built on the ideas of competition, greed, hedonism, survival of the fittest, uh, seize the day, Every individual is looking out for his own welfare. And in all, uh, it, this has reflects in all institutions, whether it's uh, insurance versus the kaful insurance is somebody trying to take advantage of uh, the distress of others. The kaful is everyone trying to help each other. Uh, democracy is whoever, uh, whichever group is in the majority, they are uh, authorized to kill. Uh, there is a very deep analysis of uh, the modernity and the Holocaust by Zygmunt. And he says that what happened to the Jews, the 6 million Jews who was burned was a natural consequence of de democracy. As if the majority wants to burn 6 million, there is nothing in the Western social science which stops them from doing so. If it is logical and rational and reasonable, you will do it if, if you think that this is the best for the group as a whole. As opposed to this, the method of Shura uh, is based on um, collective consent. It, uh, it, it tries to achieve consensus. The idea of Hegel that every nation builds its own laws and there are no laws between nations because it's all just a game of power. This is replaced by the idea of the brotherhood of mankind, which is uh, uh, the idea of justice in uh, West in, in America is adversarial. The two lawyers fight each other and whoever manages to win, wins the case. It's just like the gladi gladiator system where whoever uh, two, uh, two parties just put in their gladiators and whoever wins the fight, uh, that party is right. Uh, as opposed to this uh, in um, Islam, justice is a cooperative search for truth. The search for the correctly delineated uh, right both parties are supposed to participate in this. So in all situations, we have uh, super amazing institutions, but we have abandoned them both in practice and we have forgotten their theory. So uh, this is, I think, the last slide that uh, talk is cheap. We can always talk about perfection, but where is the, uh, where is the action? So this is a wrong framework but because first, we must create, we must have theoretical uh, progress. We must have clarity on the conceptual framework. Then we can go about building it. If, if you want to create a building, you have to have the design for it first. And then you, uh, the, today we have, we have had successful Islamic revolutions in Afghanistan, Iran, Sudan, and other places, but they have failed to create Islamic societies because no living model of Islamic societies exist because in all our dimensions of life, we are using institutions created on the basis of uh, theoretical frameworks developed by Western social sciences. So our 
banks and our insurance and our courts and our parliamentary system and our social life, our Christmases and our celebrations and our parties and everything that we do, our social life, uh, economic life, political life, uh, our relationship with the environment, these are all based on Western models. So we need to have clarity on a theoretical framework before we can actually launch. If we just go and start thrashing about trying to grab a uh, rule without knowing what we will do with it, then what uh, th this, is, uh, this is a source of a problem. And now what should be the pragmatic strategy to create change? There's a huge amount of conflict and dissent on this. And there is the discussion of top down versus bottom up approaches, both of which have been taken. And these are issues that I will discuss later. Uh, lots of people raise questions about these issues, but first we must have clarity on a theoretical framework before we can talk about lines of action because different theoretical frameworks, different diagnosis leads to different kinds of medicine. So unless we have patients and we say, let's work out a diagnosis first, then we will give the medicine. If you say that, no, let's just start uh, uh, pumping in antibiotics because they will cure any disease, then you are liable to end up with the wrong uh, because you, you haven't focused on the diagnosis, so we'll end up giving the wrong medicines. So that is the end of uh, the slides and uh, end of this lecture. And so I'll open the floor for questions. Are we, uh, uh, you, you are muted. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Uh, we have like 10 minutes, so we can proceed with the question and answer session. I have a few questions uh, on chat. We'll start with them and then we can uh, open the floor for and ask people to uh, unmute their mics. So whoever wants to ask a question, if they can raise their hands. Yeah, Muneeb so, Hussain, I see his hand. Uh, may I come in? Yes. 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 Can... Uh, assalamu alaikum, dear professor. Asa Zaman sahab, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. I am Muneeb Hussain from Indian Kashmir, and it's really an honor to hear you out, sir, on these issues that confront us all the time. And uh, basically, I may not be able to start the audio video because uh, uh, there, there is this internet issue with here with me. I can only join in through don't audio. Don't worry, just That's ask the question. question. Yeah. We can hear you clearly. I have two. Spe I, I have two specific questions. One is when one is general in nature, and another is uh, specific to economics. I, as student of economics, I have that question in mind. One is very general in nature because when you in the last slide you discussed that you know there have been evident failures in Afghanistan, Iran, or for that matter Sudan or different Muslim countries, while they were trying to do certain things that were Islamic in essence, but they could not reap the benefits and. While you tend, tend to you know associate the reasons for that uh, as very, I see them very simplistic because you then tend to say that okay we don't have that living model with us right now for Islamic societies so that is the reason why the experiments in Afghanistan, Iran, or Sudan fail. But uh, I have a very humble observation with regards to that is it's a very reductionist and very simplistic assumption that we're trying to make because. Within the uh, within the uh, well, you know the contemporary global reality is such that all these structures are controlled by this neoliberal system. All and right. Even so if this is a question on which what the appropriate strategy should be is something I will discuss yes. and it, I will answer your question, but not uh, in this session. Okay, sir. That that is one question. And second is very you know uh, that's a bit that's a bit critical about the way we conceive Islamic social sciences because. When we, because when we try to see Islamization project that has been going on from past 60 to 70 years, as a humble student of economics, what I see, sir, that is my opinion on it, you can, you can always correct me if you think otherwise, is that the neoclassical construct of homo economicus, you know, based on those three uh, basic assumptions of atomism, atomism and stuff like that, and an Islamic construct of homo economicus. I, in, in their modus operandi, if they are not, if they, they may not be identical, but I see them as blood relatives because the former in right. traditional neoclassical economics, it imagines a cell, it imagines a, you know, a selfish man which has a lightning calculator of pains and pleasures and takes perfect decisions all the time. 
But when we talk about Islamic economics or Islamic social sciences, why I we always you have that my idea? article also. called uh, Islam's Gift, an Economy of Spiritual Progress. But we cannot, uh, this is too complex to handle no, no, no. right here. So let me go on to... Sir, 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 sir let me complete my question. Let me, sir, sir, please, let me complete my question. The question is that when we see this homo, homo Islamicus now, Homo Islamicus is a, you know, the, you tend to feel of this kind of an individual is that it evokes an image of an angelic being that always uses ethical yardsticks to arrive at, you know, every economic said, decision the, or every in, decision. As I said, that, in my article called Islam's Gift and Economy of Spiritual Progress, I have explained hmm. that the issue is about the struggle to be good, not the outcome. So we don't have perfect hmm. beings. We have people who are struggling to be good. And they can be at any stage of spiritual progress from Nafse Ammara, which is homo but economicus. Way, but sir, the way we are, we are conceptualizing Islamic alternatives, this is not aren't we also the arriving that at, I just at a highly idealistic you know, position? We, uh, that is not very real, that in, that is not very real in, in terms of... Uh, excuse me, we can move on to the next question, please. Yes. Uh, Ahmed Mabrook, sir, you can ask. Please. Assalamu alaikum and jazakumullah khair. When we build Islamic, uh, yeah. when we build Islamic social science, one important topic is the basis of ethical or moral standards. This is usually there is a big debate around it, and some of the stuff like charity and being good to neighbors, things like that, can be justified based on their uh, social impact. But when it comes to the aspects of interaction between the two different genders, it is very hard to make a rational uh, argument that can convince the Western mentality. So I'm just to mention it may be something you are going to handle later or you just want to say something about it. I'm just raising the point. Thank you. Yeah, well, I think the, a very crucial insight here is that uh, basically, the fiqh which was developed over the thousand years is uh, rulings on how to behave in every realm about nations, about uh, individual behavior, about ethics, about morality, everything is covered. But I'm not saying that uh, we already have the answers. Rather, we have the framework in which uh, to work out these answers. And so, uh, we have the basis on which to create an Islamic social science. It's very complex and sophisticated basis. But uh, because the questions are all new, so we have to work out these new answers on the basis of machinery which has been built for us, but the solutions are not there. So we have to create a new Islamic psychology, a new Islamic sociology, and so on. Okay, now uh, next question, uh, is it? Can everyone hear? Okay, I'll ask the questions that I received on uh, chat. Uh, my question is how we can implement this initiative in a developing country like Pakistan. We already depend on another country. Yes, okay. Again, we are talking about the strategy for implementing. You see, there is something called, um, Yani, there is um, a very important distinction in games which is called strategy, which is the overall game plan. And then there are tactics, how to implement that game plan. What is the next uh, step that we should take? So. Uh, currently, I'm laying out the big game plan, the, the broad perspective under which once we have the uh, theoretical framework, then we will decide, okay, how can we implement this framework, which is, uh, which is the tactics. So we can't talk about tactics without having strategy. Okay, go fight there, go fight that war. But if you don't have an overall game plan, then you won't end up with success. So currently, I'm just laying out the broad framework and then we will work on the tactics. Talha has raised his hand. So Yes. Talha, please go ahead. Ji, Aslam, Dr. Saab. Wa alaikum assalam. 
uh, Jitok sir, uh, uh, in your presentation, you mentioned that um, we Islamic, uh, we have a very good uh, two techniques of uh, financial instrument like uh, uh, what you say, musharka and mudarwa or kharzi hasna. And yes. that we do not use it properly. Uh, and and since uh, we were so much uh, overwhelmed with the conventional banking, we just forgot that we have our own economic principles. Correct. So the so the the question that I have in my mind is that uh, the the current uh, practice in our uh, financial or Islamic banking sector is that they are offering musharka, mudarba, and other uh, uh, these uh, Islamic instruments that you mentioned. But the problem is that they are just uh, an alternative of, of conventional banking. For example, if if you talk about musharka, then the interest rate they you they, they apply is against Kaibor again a kaibor so so what is the difference means that they are just uh, renaming the old uh, uh, interest in and 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 then giving us in uh, something in a, in a new package or in a new in a new packet so the the, the soul or the the main crux of the thing is similar uh, well you see we have to distinguish between genuine I have a paper which is called Building Genuine Islamic Financial Institutions, in which I have said that most of what is happening today is, uh, uh, is uh, imitation. Instead of implementing Musharka, which is Islamic in spirit and form, we are taking the Musharka instrument and using it to replicate Western uh, interest-based transactions. The uh, similarly for takaful, and similarly for other uh, uh, forms. So what we see on the ground is not the genuine Islamic form, which is uh, which has an entirely different spirit behind it. We see uh, uh, use of Islamic forms to replicate Western forms, which are basically the key is the cooperative versus adversarial nature. You see, insurance in the West is adversarial. If the, uh, if the mm, client uh, wins money, the insurance company loses. And if the client is not paid the full amount of his claim, then the insurance company games. As opposed to this, the kaful is a win-win. We are all trying to help each other. And this is the spirit which, in which uh, it needs to be implemented, but it is not being done like that. Next. Okay, Kamar Abbas sahab, you can go ahead. Then uh, maybe we can uh, go back to Muni Hussain. Uh, Kamar Abbas sahab, can you hear yes, us? Yes, Assalamu alaikum. Yes, sir. Yes, Dr. Sahab, uh, I have a humble question. Uh, sir, when we say that uh, Western economic theory is nonsense, uh, Yes. We have to admit that uh, free market economy has at least been successful in maximizing production. But the area, uh, you know, where it miserably failed is equitable distribution. Because uh, free market economy relies uh, heavily on market mechanism for organizing production and distribution. Uh, on the contrary, uh, on the other hand, the socialism, socialism focused on distribution but it messed up with the uh, uh, production because uh, the socialism calls for elimination of markets. So how do you think an Islamic model of uh, economy can achieve equitable distribution without compromising production, uh, particularly uh, Islam's vision on markets, market mechanism? Thank you, sir. Well, to begin with, oh, you are, you've asked questions which are, uh, yeah, you're saying that we should let us acknowledge the accomplishments of capitalism in terms of maximizing wealth. Well, I think that if you look at cost benefit analysis, how much wealth has been produced and compare it with how much wealth has been destroyed, then uh, the hands down, uh, it has been an extremely unpleasant experience for humanity as a whole. The cost of the lost, uh, yani the portions which have been polluted and the skies and the 
destructions of more than half of the species of the planet, these are things which simply cannot be replicated in million years. We just don't have the resources. So if you, it's like, you know, if, a, if the son of a millionaire starts spending his money uh, wildly, then you say, oh, look, he is so prosperous, but he's using up resources. If you don't count the, uh, if we, we look at the benefits, we don't count the costs. And then if you do the calculation and people have done the calculation, then you find that capitalism has not been successful. Uh, it has exploited humanity and the planet. And if you just look at the cost of this exploitation, the broken families, the, 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 the species that have been destroyed by, you see, we, all of us have been enslaved to capitalism. We are all working day and night to produce wealth for the capitalist. And we don't have time for friendships. We don't have time for our wives and, and, and children. And, and this is a cost which is not considered in the GNP. And, and people who have taken this into account come up with entirely different conclusions. Okay, thank okay. you, sir. So there was a question by Noha, which I lost in the chat. So if you can ask it again. Noha. Okay, until she asks, we can go back to Munib Hussain, who's uh, okay. adamant who wants to uh, interact with you. So Munib, you can go ahead. You, you can have private time with me as much as you want. Just give me a call and we will. Uh, but if, if you'd ask a question, please make it about this lecture. Not general question about things which I did not cover in this lecture. Muni, if you want to ask, please go ahead. I have a question. Uh, Dr. Saab, you mentioned that you need a conceptual theoretical framework uh, to be in place before we go on to action items. So you think that the Islamic uh, movements have not done enough work on that. Is that what you uh, implying? Yes, absolutely. I think that the uh, this is something that I will be discussing in later lectures about the existing diagnoses of our problems by uh, at least seven different groups have tried to um, major groups and then there are lots of minor groups and many of them have um, partially uh, outlined understood the problem but I think that the central problem which is the colonization of minds and the conquest of minds and the necessity to reject you see, whenever I uh, mention this, that, okay, all of Western economics is flawed, people Im immediately start defending that, you know, uh, we should not be anti-Western and so on. So um, this kind of, yani, basically the realization that Western so social science is an illusion uh, is, is not there. And because of this, uh, many, yani, in economics, I can say that the, it's the lack of self-confidence. The, the fact that Musharka is, is different from and superior to Western interest is not there. So what we are doing is we are taking a, a better thing which we have and distorting it to match the interest-based transaction, which is worse. And the same thing is true in, in general, that we are taking um, superior Western models and distorting them to match existing Western ideals and saying that, okay, look, Islam says the same thing. For example, it's very common to hear that Islam is just teaching us democracy, even though what Islam teaches is far superior to democracy, but because West idealizes democracy, we say that, okay, because the West must be perfect and Islam is also perfect. So Islam must also be teaching us democracy, whatever it is. So this inferiority complex and this, uh, dazzlement by Western ideals makes it impossible for us to understand the true teachings of Islam. So the next question was from Noha. Professor Asad, can you direct me to any of your papers if you have discussed in it the distinction between democracy and shura? Well, this is something that uh, um, political science, uh, I have very peripherally mentioned it in a few papers. Uh, uh, more than no more than a paragraph or two, but uh, this is a topic that 
if somebody, I, since I'm not working in political science, so I haven't really dealt with it in detail, but yes, uh, this is very important. Right. There's a question by Ashar Humayu. He's asking, do we consider a Hubert model by Dr. Ramjit Sakhir as Islamic? Uh, I don't know it in detail. To the extent that I know about it, yes, I think it is. But I don't, I don't know it in sufficient detail to be, um, to, to be sure. Right. Uh, Abir Abbas, do you want to ask? Or we can take Muneeb now. Sir, yes, sir, thank you, sir. I sir, uh, I have another question. Uh, that the detractors of uh, uh, Musharika, they say that uh, there is a problem of moral hazard uh, with these Musharika things. So, how would you defend this? Well, if you read the book by Atif Mia and Amir Sufi called House of Debt, he has discussed the problem and come up with the solution. But it is complex and technical. But it, it, it can be done. Case, okay, Muneeb, uh, you can you can come in now. Everyone, can you please uh, mute your mics? Okay. Hello, Professor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for providing me one more opportunity to ask you a question. And so if I have to take one thing out of the lecture that I got uh, after engaging with this one and a half hour session is that, you know, uh, we have, this is, this is, for example, this is, uh, you know, Western system, social systems, and these are its fundamental flaws and how we can come up with an Islamic alternative because we have, for example, better institutions that have history of, uh, you know, uh, operating in, 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 in medieval times, if we have to say. But, sir, I have one very fundamental question. That is, if when we construct, for example, our economic theory from a neoclassical construction, it says us there is home. It's it's a homo economicus that, for example, uh, you know, has an has an uh, you know uh, this lightning calculator that calculates pains and pleasures and comes up with the optimal solutions. And while we compare it with Islamic, for example, Islamic social sciences or an, or an ideal Islamic man. But then, sir, and we call him that we call him uh, you know uh, homo islamicus that has ethical yardsticks to arrive at every economic decision or social decision that he confronts in his life but then sir we are basically discussing the world we are discussing the real stuff that we confront in our lives can uh, in as far as homo economics is concerned that is that lies at the one extreme of the, the, the rope and at the other extreme of the rope lies homo islamicus can a real analysis of the society be done with an individual with an imagination of an individual that is that is more angelic in nature rather than human that is my very fundamental i have question. already answered this answer question from your once, answer, but uh, if I will refer you to my Maybe paper, Islam's that. Gift, uh, An Economy of Spiritual Development. This question that you have asked does not relate to my lecture, but I have answered it in my paper, which is called Islam's Gift, An Economy of Spiritual Development. If you will download it from SSRN, then you will find the answer in Shri. Okay, Ali, uh, you can go ahead. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Professor. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Actually, <clears throat> my question, you mentioned that rather than moving towards the policy, ah. uh, the uh, social uh, science... Excuse me, can, can, can you... Can you is, uh, Mike is uh, on. Faiza. Yes, Ali, go ahead. Oh, yeah, we mentioned that before moving towards translating this uh, theoretical perspective into policy making, we have to work out the theoretical perspective of the Islamic social sciences. So from historical point of view, from where we have to start, either from from the end of the whole fire Rashidin, because anyhow, we have got a, some sort of, uh, not only some sort of in detail format of political, social, economic system at that time. So. I'm wondering, or or it would be either the end of Baghdad region. Right. Well, now you're talking about uh, these tactics. How can we implement this? But I haven't really, yes, uh, this is an issue that I will get to. This is very important. What should we do? Where? What is the first step? 
but basically in any kind of tactics you have to look at and in the fronts, there are 1,001 fronts on which we need to work. And obviously we cannot work on all of them. So we have to uh, sequence them in proper sequence. What are the easy things that we can do initially? And then how can we build on those initial steps? So all of this, I, I plan to cover in a later lecture, but... Uh, uh, but sir, is it okay uh, we can, if we can take like two more questions? What's up? Can we take two more questions? Uh, I think uh, Vakar, okay, you can yes, go I, ahead. I, I, I can take. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Sab, I am. Dr. Sab, I appreciate your support. You have launched this platform and we have been able to get the people who are connected to the platform and we have been able to get the support. और इसके बारे में डॉक्टर मेरा ऐसा है बोथ माइक्स आर म्यूटेड नाउ जी डॉक्टर आपको आवाज आ रही मेरी सर हाँ आ रही है कैन यू कैन यू क्वेश्चन इन इंग्लिश बिकॉज़ देर लॉट्स ऑफ पीपल हु डोंट स्पीक उर्दू इन दिस ओके सर आई यूज इंग्लिश सर uh, sir, uh, I want to understand that uh, our uh, elders have done a lot of work in different fields uh, in the mid uh, medieval era. Uh, yes. So about uh, economics and the marketing and uh, all things like that. Uh, yes. Which type, of which uh, person has done most of the work and uh, which a type of book he written in Arabic or any translation in English or any other language, sir? Well, you see, there is no book that we can find which will solve our problems of today. Our elders fought their own battles against uh, problems of their times. And today we have to fight our own battles using the methodologies and the tools they, they provided. But we can't go and look up the solution to our problems in ancient books. Okay, Faiza, you can go ahead. Yes, Faiza. Go ahead. Faiza, we can't hear you. Slow and unclear. Can Hello? you speak closer to the mic? Hello? Yes, uh, please go ahead. Yes, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, uh, uh, thanks for a lot for this panel and uh, thank you, Dr. Saab, for this. Uh, for the presentation. My question really, I think it jives with everyone else's over here to find out if there is more any kind of empirical evidence of the wonders Islamic finance has done or Islamic economics has done. Um, you're referring to creating your own uh, uh, economic theory at this point in time, uh, or sorry, using the economic theory of the past, but uh, is there any empirical evidence that we can use from from the history to see what it did? And, yes, uh, that was covered that in time? the first lecture. 1,000 years of Islamic civilization, no one had to... Uh, when people said that I want to get knowledge, no one uh, said, okay, bring your money, then I will, uh, I will uh, teach you. When people were sick, for a thousand years, nobody said that, where is your money? If, you're, if you don't have money, then you will not get treatment. It was uh, understood by the entire society that it is our social responsibility, our collective responsibility, farzi kafaya, to feed all the hungry, to educate all those who want to be educated and to take care of the widows and to take care of the poor. This was a social responsibility and it was fulfilled by the aqaf for 1,000 years in the Islamic civilization. Today, uh, capitalism says that if you are hungry and you don't have money, then you deserve to be hungry, and so on. 
So that is the empirical evidence. Okay, thank you. Right, Shavaz, uh, you are next. Please go ahead with your question. Or uh, Noah, do you want to ask something until Shavaz uh, turns on his mic? Your mic is unmuted. Okay, Shavaz, you can go ahead. Shabazz Gul, do you want? Do you have a question? Uh, I think not. Uh, we can conclude today's session. There are no more questions. Right. People are raising hands, right. but they are not asking. What we can do but is we, we have received one question, please. Okay, it's Wakar again. Uh, now, one thing that we can do is you see the ThinkLink uh, course uh, has comments and questions. Uh, provision. So you can ask. Uh, also, uh, I, my email has been provided. You can send me an email to ask a question. So, um, yes, and, and we have received a number of questions on chat. Also, if any question has been missed, we'll pull, uh, Dr. Sa will answer those on email. Uh, those questions will get to Dr. Sa when he'll respond. Sir, just one minute if you can, sir. All right. Okay, please go ahead. Sir, thank you very much. Uh, sir, uh, I want to ask, what is your opinion about the fiat currency? There is a lecture of mine on this issue, but this was not my, in my current lecture, uh, so I won't talk. But you can look up. Um, this is a complex question, and I have many different uh, lectures on this issue of monetary policy. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Uh, Asher Hamayu is uh, saying, is asking to address his question. I think his question was about uh, Amjad Saqib's uh, economic model. Yes, I said so that to the extent yes. that I know, it is very good and Islamic. I do not know it in uh, specific details enough to give a fatwa on it. Right, and Asher, you can uh, always post. Uh, okay, here's a comment. Please correct me. I understand economics builds on peace, which requires just power. Only then a positive political dialogue can promote to lift human to its creator. Well, I think if we look at how the Prophet ﷺ operated to bring a revolution, we see that he operated during a period where there was lots of conflict and adversity and battles, and he managed to succeed uh, and um, the same message has the same power today. All right, so I think that I think we should conclude here. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Saab. And if anyone feels that their questions have not been addressed, they can always post them uh, on our platform. Uh, you've been emailed and also we'll take questions from this chat if any, any question has been missed. Thank you all for uh, attending today's lecture. And I would request mm -hmm. again, if uh, someone has not registered, please go and register on Think Thinkling Institute's website. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Saab, for patiently taking so many questions. Uh, thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.